Thank you for joining the Once Changing the World, which is India's first future tech meets sustainability podcast. And today, I'm delighted and honored to have with me Dr. Joe Zainer, who is the founder and CEO of the Odin, and is a global leader in the biohacker movement, who is pushing the boundaries of science outside traditional environments. Dr. Joe received a prestigious fellowship to work with NASA's synthetic biology program, engineering bacteria to help terraform Mars. Dr. Joe has a number of scientific publications and awards for work in protein and genetic engineering and also writes the amazing Amateur Gods blog. So Dr. Joe, sure. really appreciate and I'm completely honored to have you on, on the show. Now you, you, yeah. uh, you, you're a biohacker and, and you've done really out there things you know, and there, there, are your, there are peers who maybe do not like you so much. So, so I, I want to start with uh, biohacking. So uh, as a biohacker, you have chosen to biohack yourself and also change your gender. So can you share more about your personal experience and, and the process? Yeah, so biohacking is kind of like people doing science outside traditional environments and just taking control of biology, our biology and the biology of the world, right? Because up till this point in time in human history, everything that happened in biology or through DNA, we really had no control over, right? So like people who were born, right? Their genetics were determined by, in some way by random chance or the things that grow, you know, the genetics of these things were determined by some amount of random chance. But through modern science and, and medicine, we've gained the ability to actually change DNA and biology to a certain extent how we see fit, right? And that gives us the ability to explore and do things that we couldn't completely do before. For me, a lot of this has to do with like body and medical freedom, right? A lot of times it doesn't matter where you live or or what medical guidelines you live over, the governments or or people prevent us from being able to treat ourselves or do to our bodies what we see fit, you know? They outlaw medicines, they outlaw drugs, they don't approve them, or they don't give us access to them. And uh, I think that's harmful for society. So, you know, to me, biohacking is is all of these things. Would you like to talk about your journey and as your transition, you know, how you have transitioned from Josiah Zena to Joe Zena? I mean, can you talk about the process? Outward appearance and expression of gender is something that a lot of people in society see as very fixed, right? Like this is what we define as a, a male person and this is what we define as a female person. The thing is, if you look in biology and, and life in general, it's not so clear cut. There are many organisms that change sex over time right? And that's crazy. There are many organisms that um, are able to present themselves differently. And it, it is, you know, something that they are capable of doing. Now, in humanity, a lot of times up till this point, we haven't really had that ability. Um, just because of the the way that medicine and um you know the place that society is in but with modern medicine and modern treatments we're starting to have that ability to allow people to change these outward things about their body i think what people don't understand is that gender is nothing more than an expression on the body from hormonal changes inside the body being able to control those hormonal expressions, how we see fit to present ourselves, how we see fit, I think is a uh, very beneficial to humanity, whether that's taking testosterone to make yourself appear more male and strong or taking something like estrogen to do the opposite. I, I think we 
moving out of the boxes because i think religion society uh the world itself i think puts you in 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 this boxes you know that this is the way you're supposed to be and this is the way you've got to live your life but i i think this convergence of technology and us understanding the source code alive the dna the, the genetics who who we are what we are i think eventually maybe we'll 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 break away out the shackles or, or or the barriers that you know we we cage ourselves you know, into sure. and, and 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 go beyond and 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 I'm really delighted and honored to have a conversation with somebody who's one of those front movers now you yeah. know being, being a front mover of this technology obviously comes with a lot of cons you know because you you're breaking a lot of barriers because you know the society you know structure everything wants you to be in a certain way how how how's the society the world uh, you know reacted to your choice your preference of you know biohacking yourself you know changing your gender changing my gender is uh i i mean in culture in in western culture it's very it's it's pretty well accepted um people have come to the place where they understand that these forms of expression are something that's positive for society right um it brings about more acceptance and more love to people i think the gender expression in terms of biohacking all the other experiments i've also done around genetic engineering and, and stuff like that on myself um i think it it falls under this idea of what most people call transhumanism right and the idea of transhumanism like you were saying is that we shouldn't be stuck in the genetics and the bodies that we were given at birth we should be able to have a choice you know and we do to some extent you know some people dye their hair or some people change the clothes they wear in or you know put makeup on on their skin like people do a lot of things to change their appearance and the idea that we can also change this you know flesh thing that we live in is this idea of transhumanism that we should be able to move forward and change our bodies not just our gender but also things you know like grow other limbs or you know express ourselves in technologically interesting in different ways right yeah so so i i think through history uh, i think we humans have been continuously augmenting ourselves in ways you know even even this glasses it, it, it's kind of an augmentation and you know there's cochlear implants and so on and so forth and these these things have completely uh, changed the way and added more how we can perceive the life you know better so i, I it, it, it's just that the, the structures once we break down you know with this convergence of technology this metaverse web 3 artificial intelligence i i, I think there'll be more acceptance of, of this this the, these kind of things you know how we can self express uh, or, or self now uh, uh you, you spoke about uh you know genetic editing and and you are a, a proponent of uh, genetic modification uh, how, yeah. how do you how do you see the role of genetic modif- modification in improving healthcare i don't think it's just healthcare though healthcare is a big part but i think it's just um our bodies in general right because a lot of things that people might see as cosmetic let's say um you know weight loss or muscle building or athletic performance um i think genetic modification can benefit all these things right so everybody has certain dna that they are given at birth um not by choice this is dna that we just have from our parents from their parents dna that we have no choice over whether we get it or not and over the past let's say 10 years we've really started to understand how we can modify this dna to do things differently in humans and there have been um three fda approved gene therapies um a gene therapy approved in europe also which allow 
people to modify the human body for disease purposes, right? And it's been uh, groundbreaking the things that we can do. But the thing is, is that genetic modification is so much more than just disease. Well, that's great and amazing. And, you know, we'll see lots of breakthroughs. I think the interesting thing is also going to be for non-disease reasons, right? And uh, that's going to be really cool to see people be able to modify their genes and do things that we couldn't do before or express themselves differently or, you know, but like I said, grow an extra limb or a tail or wings or something like human beings, I think, in the next 50 years are going to start changing a lot because we now have control over our genetics. When you say that in, in the next 50 years, you know, human being as a species is going to change, you know, we'll have possibly wings, you know, tails and, and the, these various ways how we can augment ourselves. What's the cutting edge of technology, you know, amongst the bio biohackers, you know, what what can we expect to see possibly this decade and beyond? So I think right now, what we're really limited by is just people being able to test this stuff, right? because the knowledge and the access to these resources has been extremely limited, um, the development of this technology has been extremely limited. So what we are seeing in humans is so far behind what we can see in other organisms and animals, right? Our understanding and use of genetic modification in other animals has been great. And we've been able to do crazy stuff, you know? like make flies with four wings and, you know, grow weird body parts out of animals um, because people have spent the time and resources to experiment with these things. Humans is, is a different thing. We are just entering this point where people are starting to experiment and it's not a lot of people, right? Because the traditional scientific community isn't really into experimenting with these things on humans. And that's where the biohackers come in. A group of people who are rebellious against the traditional scientific establishment and into doing these experiments on themselves to see what the results can be. And we're starting to see very promising results. Um, you know, in during the pandemic, me and a few other biohackers worked on a DNA-based vaccine for COVID, and we saw immune responses in ourselves. And this DNA-based vaccine that we worked on is now used by other countries in the world. I think India even, um, one of the vaccines used there is a DNA-based vaccine. And this was before anybody else had any vaccines out available to the public, right? And so you're talking this this vaccine was a genetic modification of our cells to protect us. And it was pushing science way further forward than it was at the time. Right. Stuff like this is what's possible when people are willing to experiment on themselves. Right. Yeah. There, there's some very interesting things happening, you know, because at one point in time, I think, you know, the access to knowledge was, you know, largely uh, there for the, you know, the Harvards and, and, and the Cambridge, Cambridges and stuff like that. But, you know, today with, with, with the democratization of knowledge through, you know, these MOOCs, open up uh, uh, free uh, courses, uh, you know, and, and online learning, I think it, it's the democratization of knowledge is, is changing the world. You know, today, maybe uh, 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 unknown random person sitting, you know, in the obscure part of the world you yeah. know who, who's like possibly open to the ideas and and having conversations and reaching out to people can change the world if he or she desires to you know and and, and that's 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 really really cool you, you mentioned about i mean you look at you look at you look at like right you look at like linux right or like android you know android is based off of linux based operating systems or something like if you ask somebody like who do you think created the most used operating system in the world? You know, people would say, oh, you know, Microsoft or somebody from Harvard or someplace like that. When in fact, it was Linus Torvalds, who was just somebody working in his apartment in Finland. Right. He was just programming his in his apartment in Finland. And he developed what would be the Linux operating system, which is now 
you know, the most used operating system and the foundation for Android and all these other things. It wasn't a big company. It wasn't, you know, somebody from a fancy university or anything like that. Anybody can do these things if you make them accessible. Anybody can change the world, I think, right? You mentioned about you know genetic modification of augmenting human beings, and there are people doing some really fantastic stuff. And you mentioned about the DNA-based vaccine. Can you describe some yeah. more specific genetic modification technologies or therapies, uh, or, or you know ways of it which can be biohacked? So the thing is, is that a lot of genetic engineering never makes it to the clinic. Um, so we see human experimentation in the scientific and medical literature but it never actually makes it to broad human use. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Funding, you know, um, regulatory environment, um, you know, the market and all these things. But there are a lot of genetic modifications and gene therapies that have shown promise um, in, in terms of like just general human augmentation. And um, some of those are, generally revolve around, you know, muscular and athletic performance. Um, for example, experiments with people who have Becker muscular dystrophy, you know, muscular dystrophy is like a muscle wasting disease where people lose their muscle. Um, they've experimented with growing muscle in these people by using this genetic modification that is a, a folostatin protein. It causes muscle to grow in, in our bodies. And they put this gene in people and it's been shown to build muscle and help them be able to walk, right? Which is pretty impressive. Now you imagine you can also apply something like this to somebody who can already walk to increase their muscle, to make them faster runner or, or something like that. They've shown that drugs like, um, or genes like uh, VEGF, they call it VEGF which is a gene that increases the vascularization of tissue, right? So people in diabetes, they've tested this on because a lot of times with people with diabetes, what happens is in their extremities, they get poor blood circulation. And then sometimes they have to have these limbs amputated. Well, you can imagine, you could also use that for somebody who wants to have a lot of muscular endurance. You increase the the uh, vascularization of tissue it increases the blood flow to the tissue it allows your your muscles to perform longer at a higher level right so you're talking sometimes these very simple things that have been tried and tested on humans and shown promise um that haven't made it through the clinic for regulatory or other reasons um we know of right now that we could use in humans to improve ourselves biologically. Can you talk about what you're currently working on? The things I'm currently working on aren't related to genetic modification, so to speak. I mean, there's some stuff that I'm interested in, in terms of uh, expressing proteins that, or genes, you know, proteins come from genes. So generally when I say proteins, I mean genes also. Um, expressing genes that produce hormones, you know, like gender specific or sex specific hormones. Um, a lot of times people who um, either want to take more testosterone or more estrogen, right? They have to take a pill every day or a shot, you know, inject themselves in their muscular tissue. Um, when you could probably genetically modify somebody so that their body just produces more of this. Say you have like low testosterone, right? And um, your body generally doesn't produce enough testosterone. You could put a gene in the body that makes more of this, um, which is interesting and, and would be fairly simple. It would just be, um, you know, doing the experiment, measuring all the things. So that's something that I've been working on right now. Um, the other things I've been working on are more towards uh, like growing tissue. Um, so we're talking about like artificial wounds and um, growing tissue in, you know, cell culture outside of organisms. And uh, yeah, I'm working a lot on that stuff, figuring out um, the 
the the growth media and the environment that these tissues need to survive and last longer outside of bodies. Andrew Hessel uh, is the founder of Human Genomics. Uh, he wants to synthetically engineer life. How far do you think we are away from being able to start creating, building life from scratch? Yeah, Andrew and I are good friends. Um, uh, I think we are... This is one of the interesting things about biology, right? Is that every cell that is in existence has come from another cell, right? There's never been a cell created that didn't come from another cell that we know about. Human beings have never been able to artificially create a cell. Um, and I think that's one of the most fascinating things about biology is that we literally live in a world of a technology that we don't understand. It's almost like this alien technology, right? Like cells. They are this alien technology that we don't completely understand. We can't recreate cells. It is just we we arrived in this world and now we're trying to decode how it all works. Um, I Cells are really hard because... It's kind of like trying to build a car while it's driving, you know, it's, uh, it's hard to build a cell that isn't already living because it needs to be alive to be able to turn it into a cell. Um, and while not impossible, <clears throat> I think it's, uh, definitely a, a very interesting and difficult task. I think one day, obviously, human beings will be able to do it. Um, but I think before then, we will just learn how to repurpose cells, you know, take cells that already are there and modify them in ways that they can be used, you know, differently. George Church has been working on de-extinction, you know, trying to bring back the, the mammoth and, and, and the Tasmanian tiger. Uh, what, what are your views on that? I think that those are interesting projects. Um, I don't know how useful they are. To me, it's kind of like, what would you rather do? Um, reminisce about something that used to be or create something new that's even better you know to me i i try to look forward and not back and so i think a lot about um you know what can we create new you know not that there's anything wrong with trying to de-extinct species i think that's very interesting um it'd be cool to see you know like a saber-toothed tiger or something something like that. Um, but also like, that seems kind of boring. I, you know, I want to see a Pegasus or like a unicorn or something, a dragon, right? Why make a re, re bring back, you know, the dodo bird or something when you can make a dragon, like everybody wants a dragon, right? You know, when I say cool, I also know that it's also scary, you know, because I think we humans, uh, for the first time, uh, uh, have the capabilities to even, you know, think about, you know, building things like that. A and I, I guess it always starts with an idea. It always starts with somebody crazy enough to think that it's possible. And if not today, if not in the next 10 years, I'm sure it'll be possible in the next 100 years if there's crazy minds such as yourself who are going beyond and doing it. But yes, I think, you know, when we're going and building things like that, we also need to look at, you know, what could be the downsides of, of things yeah. like that, you know, when we, so yeah. is that something that you kind of think about? Because uh, we may, in the course of conversation, you're mentioning about, you know, the democratization of knowledge, you know, because today I think people sitting in, students can kind of tinker around with CRISPR-Cas9 genetic editing tools, you know, you yourself uh, sell, do, do it yourself, you know, CRISPR editing tools. Does that kind of worry you about, you know, what kind of future we're getting into? Or, or, or do you think that we humans are smart enough and we'll be always be able to take <laughs> care of our world? I don't know if humans are smart enough. Um, yeah, I think um, 
were very primitive. I, I forget who said it, what was the quote, but it's something like, you know, we have paleolithic brains and godlike technology. Um something like that. And it's true. Um I think the thing is, is instead of trying to inhibit or slow down technology, which people often do, I think instead we should approach it from the point of view is how to start off with and say like, how can we make this technology most beneficial and most accessible, right? Because I think whenever we have technology that's accessible, whenever um, the control, the power around the technology is more decentralized, we see it become much, much more beneficial. We saw that a lot with the, the computing and internet revolution, right? When the technology was, the, the control of the technology was decentralized, it just created such a rapid evolution and growth that now we all benefit from the technology. And I think the same thing can be had with biological technology. Are there bad things that happen? Yeah, like we never saw the negative effects of things like social media and how that, what that would have on our psyche and like how, how much it's, you know, negatively affects people and a lot of other negative effects of misinformation and, you know, all these things in our media, those things are hard to predict. Um, but I think that if we start off um, trying to be positive and beneficial with these technologies, you know, I think the good will far away the bad. Right. I, I completely double that. So how do we go about making it beneficial and accessible for all? Because, you know, right now in the course of conversationing, you know, you, you're mentioning about gene therapies. And, and there's an article that you, you wrote on December 28th, your newsletter was in the pharma industry and the, the gene therapy title, a 3.5 million <laughs> gene therapy. Yeah. So uh, how, how do we, because because I, I'm sure you must be getting so many letters from distressed parents of children who are yeah. suffering. and how, how do we do that? How do we make this beneficial and accessible for everyone? Yeah, it's extremely difficult. And I think it starts with education. You know, I think that like in order for people to be able to uh, help and benefit each other in, in the society, like people need to understand how this technology works, be able to, you know, use this technology if possible to benefit everybody. I think it's the same thing with... Um, you know, computer programming, right? It's like, if I want an app that, I don't know, helps me schedule my day, I don't have to sit there and go and program an app that helps me schedule my day. Somebody else has already done that. And I could just go on an app store, download that app, pay whatever, you know, 99 cents or, you know, whatever, 4.99 it costs to buy this app. And that benefits me. And I think it's the same thing. We need more people who understand and can use this technology. And once that happens, then I think it makes it a lot more available and accessible to people so that they can benefit themselves. But right now, I think the state that everything is in is like, we know more about how our computers work than we do about our DNA. And the DNA is what makes us alive. That's crazy, right? We don't even understand about ourselves and i think that needs to change a lot right so so how much do we understand truly of our dna you know because mm -hmm. we, it, it's a complex complex human body with trillions of cells going bonkers how much do we currently understand we understand enough to do cool things and be a little bit dangerous <laughs> but not enough to where we can do whatever we want you know and so it's a, uh, it's an interesting point we are at because we have amazing powers and control, but you know we don't completely know how to harness this stuff. You know, it's like we can't just go and be like, I want to make grow a field of corn that is as tall as an oak tree, right? We can't do that yet. We kind of understand the genetics behind that stuff but we can't quite do it yet. But realistically, right, 
anything that you see in nature is possible to play around with genetically. If you've seen it in an organism, there's no reason that it can't be biologically created in another organism or changed or modified, right? So what breakthroughs you think are needed where we can get into a safe genetic e editing without any unwanted uh, consequences? I don't think we necessarily need any breakthroughs. I think the the state we're at right now is pretty good. Um, I think most uh, gene therapies and things like that, um, treatments with genes have been fairly safe. Um, one of the biggest um, problems is just the si the toxicity of sometimes when people have a rare disease and they try to, um, you know, fix it, they'll put in so much DNA, so much of the gene therapy that that will cause a toxic effect. But a side effect from the actual gene therapy is very rare, right? Um, and so a lot of these are very, very, very safe gene therapies, testing DNA. DNA or gene therapies on yourself is is generally a really safe thing. It's more just, you know, will the government, will society let us do that or be okay with it? Um, and people's knowledge and understanding of it. Right. I, I hope the regulators, I hope the government uh, and, and, and the fear-mongering media kind of... Uh, allows you know science which is safe uh and, and and accessible because you know there's so many people around the world who are look you know confined to their beds or, or with various kind uh, condition and and through these you know tools such as gene therapy genetic genetic modification the healthcare industry could be completely upended is there yeah. uh, for for the healthcare could could you talk about some some of the gene therapies though you mentioned about the price points 3.5 million dollars yeah. is there something that is accessible at this point in time can be accessible yeah for sure um i mean the problem is, is uh, these gene therapies that are provided by these companies um, aren't very accessible. Uh, to recreate them is very accessible. Um, generally, these gene therapies, what they do is they essentially just replace a bad gene in people's bodies with a good gene, with a good copy of the gene. Um, so they're just putting a good copy of the gene in your cells. There's really no fancy... Um, technology or anything that really goes into it. Why does it cost so much? One of the reasons it costs so much is because um, the regulations around the production of these gene therapies is extremely strict. So most of these gene therapies are, aren't like, they're not really cost prohibitive. It's the regulation around their production where like right now, a lot of say if you get a pill the manufacturing around the pill and things like that are much 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 less strict than if say you were to get a biologic like a gene therapy and that makes the cost of production of gene therapies to meet the regulations kind of expensive um and so it's the system that's kind of creating this environment that is causing companies to um, not only have to charge a lot of money, but be able to charge a lot. Of money. If there was some competitiveness in the market around these things, if there were less strict regulations and standards, it would allow the price of a lot of these pharmaceuticals to be driven down and be beneficial to anybody. But if you wanted to right now, go recreate one of these gene therapies and order it from a company to have it manufactured, you could do it for a fraction of the price. Uh, I have a question from my listener. His name is Ishan yeah. Datta. He says that even though the price point and ease to do a gene edit has been lowered significantly, still the complicated clinical trial regulations, FDA appro approval yeah. process 
acts as an hindrance in fully realizing a biotech startup in a garage into practicality so how do you see these hurdles being overcome by say kids who want to start their biotech startup with you know as little as maybe uh, 100 dollar capital i think people need to stop thinking about biotech as just pharmaceutical right i think that's what everybody thinks about it's like biotech is pharmaceutical but you think about what's going to be the 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 trillion dollar biotech product you know what's going to be the iphone of biotech it's not going to be a pharmaceutical it's going to be some consumer product right it's going to be something like a dragon right if you were to make a dragon in your garage right and and sell these to people a little you know little mini baby dragon or something like that everybody would want one as a pet and i think people need to start thinking about biotech differently don't think about it in terms of pharmaceuticals only think about it as how can you create consumer products from this because that's when the revolution's really going to begin right once you make the consumer product that people can buy and use like the iphone when you make the iphone of biotech right that's the ne- going to be the next you know global biotech brand right it's going to be the person who figures out what that is and what is that i don't know yet it's it's not so easy just to predict the future and what's going to come up with it but there's so many opportunities with you know engineering plants engineering animals engineering you know foods or whatever to make something that's unique and cool and interesting right yeah there is so much which is going on people kind of engineering food and so on and so forth there's, there's a second question from ishan datta itself he says how far are we from uh, using glowing plants as street lamps <laughs> glowing plants is a very difficult one there's a lot of other cool things you can do with plants probably right now you know my company the odin we sell plant genetic engineering kits where you can change the colors of plants Glowing is a difficult biological process in general um because it takes so much energy to emit light like that. And so getting up to a place where we can have glowing plants um where we can significantly see them glowing I think is going to be very difficult, right? There's not a lot of glowing organisms in the world. Um and you're talking billions of years of evolution we don't have a lot of glowing organisms and there's a reason for that right um generally these organisms are very small bacteria um things like that um or the glowing isn't constant you know like uh um fireflies um so uh these things are 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 a bit difficult um so i i think it'll happen in the future but i think we're still a little ways away from it because you know it's a difficult problem in terms of energy consumption right right so so forever we have held this view that aging disease and death is an unalterable even eventuality Mm-hmm. how 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 close do you think we are from altering this assumption <laughs> oh wow um aging i think is interesting i think a lot of people um want to fight against um death right they're interested in how can i live longer or eventually become immortal which sounds like a science fiction movie um and it kind of is but you have to think about what are to start off you have to think about what are the major causes of death right generally the major causes of death are just like old age um there are other things heart disease cancer other like lifestyle diseases almost Uh, that even if i could right now you know inject you with something or wave a magic wand and say you know you will never die of aging you'll probably die of cancer you know in 150 years right 
And so I think the first step to, and, you know, help people live forever, quote unquote, is to fix some of these major diseases. Now, people are talking a lot about health span these days, which is, you know, live the same amount of time, but be more functional for that period of time. I think this is a lot more reasonable and achievable for certain things. You know, we talked a bit earlier about um, muscles, you know, and like increasing people's muscle. A lot of times in old age, what happens is people lose muscles. And so they lose their ability to balance and they fall and they hurt themselves and things like that. So um, helping people grow more muscle using gene therapy would be like a good way to increase health span. Um, you know, heart disease. So reducing heart disease, reducing lipid accumulation and things like that would be a good way to increase health span. And I think those things are very reasonable and very possible. I think the problem is, is just that most medical and regulatory bodies don't really see age as a disease or health span as a, a something that needs treatment. And so getting these things available to the general public right now is going to be extremely difficult. Right. There was a talk, there was a talk by Bill Gates uh, on YouTube, you know, which is titled How CRISPR Could Save Lives and End Disease. And, and, and the normal general assumption, you know, with genetic CRISPR Cas9 editing is that, you know, people think that that genetic editing is the be end uh, for everything, you know, hmm. possibly the all diseases uh, could completely be eradicated. Is, is that something which is possible? I don't think so. You know, it's it's because uh, you people are thinking about all known diseases or all things we face now, but you have to understand that biological biology is a constantly evolving system, right? And so it's a system that is constantly trying to keep itself in balance. And so even if, say, we figure out how to get rid of cancer, that's not to say that new types of illnesses or diseases or new types of genetic mutations that do different stuff to us aren't going to affect our lives as illnesses or diseases, right? And so I think that's the issue is that like saying you are trying to re remove all illness and disease is it, it's, it, it's a never ending battle. Will we be able to make one day um eradicate a lot of cancer or things like that i think so for sure i don't think uh like cancer is something we understand really well it's just we really lack the tools to fight against it um and so i think one day we will be able to get rid of all that but all diseases in general i think that's you know i don't think that's really possible what's the moonshot that you're going after if I had a billion dollars, I think the thing that I would be most interested in researching, a lot of people think about artificial intelligence in terms of computer systems, which is, who knows if we'll ever get there, you know? Um, but I like to think about artificial intelligence in terms of biological systems. Um, what if you can take an animal and give it maybe not human adult human like intelligence but what if you could give it the intelligence of i don't know a five-year-old right what if you could take a gorilla you know uh, uh one of our closest uh ancestors or monkeys and give it the intelligence of a five-year-old um i think that these things are not as complicated as creating, say, an artificial general intelligence. There, they would be much more reasonable and easier. Um, and I think that would be something that would be really interesting to pursue. Who, who are the rock star scientists uh, you look up to? Who are my favorite scientists? You know, I tend to be more um, artistically bent than scientifically bent. But um, one of... Uh, you know, my friends and 
and scientists I really appreciate. Um, somebody whose mind I really appreciate is Drew Endy. He's a professor at Stanford. Um, he has a really interesting, him and I, we think a lot alike. He has a really interesting brain and in how he thinks about the future of biotechnology and things like that. Um, it's really cool and interesting. Um, artists um, that I really appreciate, Lucy McRae, who does some work in, you know, futures and biological futures and things like that. Um, she's a, an artist that uh, I, I really enjoy and like, and I, I really love seeing her work. Have you been to India? Any, any travel plans to India? No, but I'm actually giving a talk for a conference in India. So if people are interested, they should check it out. Uh, I'll be doing a Zoom talk. I won't actually be there, unfortunately. I would love to visit India one day. Um, but yeah, that, that will be February 2nd to 5th. So look it up. It's uh, thedarwin.in. So thedarwin.in. Um, it should be a conference in India. I think they might have an in-person portion of it. Um, so, you know, people can check that out. I, I think these convergence of technologies are going to open up so many opportunities. I think that the way we do music, yeah. the way do, we do art, the way we we communicate, uh, you know, where we, where, how we experience learning, I think everything can be changed. And maybe we might break away from a centralized way of functioning into something which is decentralized, where people from all around the world join hands and say, okay, okay this is me He's sitting here in India. Can we leverage that tool? And, and can we do yeah. this together and, 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 you know, yeah. and grow the ecosystem together? So I think we are living in a fantastic, fantastic uh, point of time. I think we just need to tread carefully. Someone who's been vested yeah. in biotech for, for the longest time, would you be able to leave us behind? with the next possibly uh, 30 or 40 years you know how do you think the world is going to look like how how are us humans are, are, are going to change i think that's the thing that we all have to start embracing um is that human beings are going to change and they are starting to change you know and some people are fighting against it because they think it's unnatural or they don't understand it you know, oh, this person looks different. Oh, this person doesn't abide by society and culture ways that humans should look or act or do things. Um, the thing is, is we're going to, that's going to change so much in the next, you know, 10, 20, 50 years because people are starting to understand that they can change these things. And I think coming to terms with that and being accepting of that, that like human beings aren't going to be what they are now in a hundred years they're going to be totally different right we understand how to change our genes it's too late we're not going to stop doing it we're only going to do it more and more and more and more till i imagine eventually one day 500 years from now human beings might not be recognizable as to what we are right now right and that's great but we have to come to terms with that. And I think what I would tell people is that like, look, you're not going to change the world by doing and acting like everybody else, right? The world is changed by people who are willing to do something different and risk something. And so if you can, if, if people who are listening to this can start thinking about that, like do different things risk something because doing the same thing that everybody else is doing is only going to get you to the same place that everybody else is. Right. Thank you. Thank you once again. Yes, I, I think your education system, you know, where we, the schools and the colleges, you know, these 40, 50 students, you know, sitting in front of the blackboard and everybody yeah. is looking, you know, at the, at the blackboard, you know, and yeah, so I think we need to do things which is out of the box and, and that's where uh, because the society is changing and, and it's inevit inevitable, you know, the place where we're going, I think we all need to join hands and, and, you know, make that step into that future brighter. So really appreciate you taking time and being part of the podcast. To my listeners, if you like what you see in here, then please press the subscribe button. And until next time, see you guys. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Yeah, this. like and subscribe, right? Like and subscribe. <laughs> this is the podcast. Thank you.